everybody on oh, we're recording hey everybody we're recording uh, and hey everyone here we appreciate y'all coming early uh so we could capture as much light as we could today is our fruit production day and what better time to talk about fruit production when it's bitterly cold outside and there's nothing blooming uh but this is the time of year and even earlier than now when did you say y'all started pruning we started pruning in the last week of january it was a little earlier but uh, the weather was good so yeah, we started so. doing that and about uh about once a week, I have the master gardener trainees out here to get some hands-on experience. So we're taking it kind of slow, but we can go, we can prune all the way through the end of March or even into April. Yeah. So this is the time of year that we do our fruit tree pruning. And this is Ron Novak. He's one of our master gardeners, expert on fruit trees. He is the manager of all of these heirloom fruit trees we have here. We have apples and peaches. Um, and all a lot of these varieties date back to the 1800s. One apple, one peach variety dates back to the 1600s. Uh, re re recreating the way it was in 1870 when Moscow Carter, after the war, replanted the orchard. So that's what this is. This is a National Historic Landmark here, as of 1953. So that's what we're trying to do is make it look like for the tourists and everything like that, local, what it looked like in 1870. So all these are old heirloom varieties with, uh, uh, same varieties, not the ones that were planted here then. <laughs> Same variety. Same variety as they have back then. So these have been here for about how many years? Uh, some of those, like behind you, they're about uh, they're nine years old. And then as you get down to that corner, they were planted earlier and later. And they're about six, five to six. Some of the big peach trees are 10 years old. And some, some of these are two years old. <laughs> The little ones, a little width over there. That's what I. That's what you get. So when you're buying these trees, you're buying them at a much smaller size, and eventually they'll get up to size. Uh, but the, one of the most important things with fruit trees is pruning, and that's what we're doing this time of year. We're pruning them and shaping them so that we can get uh, the fruiting where we want it to be. We're also, cleaning out for disease problems. That's probably our biggest hurdle with fruit tree production, our disease and insect pests. Our climate is ripe for humidity, and so humidity brings in a lot of issues. So with fruit tree production, we've <coughs> got to be really good about pruning, and also what Ron does here is spray. Um, whether you're doing organic or you're doing conventional sprays, it's really important to time those correctly and get those on when they're needed, because otherwise you're fighting a losing battle against the disease and insect pests that we who has fruit trees currently on their property? Have they been neglected or? Yeah, yeah. I just put them out <laughs> last, uh, last uh, year, so they're just, just the ones. like that. Mm -hmm. Just little ones? Yeah. Okay. Well, we have some great publications I did not print out, um, but you can look out for neglected fruit trees and rehabbing them. You can, you can, you can rehab those neglected fruit trees and get them back to more bigger, vigorous production. Um, and then we have some great publications on starting your fruit trees and getting those uh, to where you want them to be. So we're going to talk about this, uh, talk about fruit tree pruning in, in just a second. But if you've got the handouts I gave you, uh, those are some great new publications that came out. If you didn't get them, I'll give them to you all in a little bit. Um, new publications on blueberries and cane berries. So our cane berries are blackberries and raspberries. And so it's all about uh, variety selection and growing blueberries and cane berries in Tennessee. When I get calls about fruit trees, I caution people that they're a lot of work, right, Ron? I mean. I, I don't know how people can make a living in Tennessee growing fruit trees commercially. They do. Uh, they do. It's hard. It is. It's a so lot. That's exactly what you said. Yep. The disease and insects that you fight, it, it's a constant battle. And so when you're taking on fruit tree production, you're taking on a lot. I mean, just the pruning time it takes to get these to the way you want them, get them pruned, and it eats up a lot of your schedule. And then keeping on your spray schedule and all that, and still at the end of it, not really knowing if you're going to get good fruit production. Uh, so taking on fruit trees can be a task. We do have fruit options that are a little bit uh, lower maintenance, I would say. There's no zero maintenance fruit. There's no zero maintenance anything. Uh, Y'all know that coming into this class. Everything requires some effort behind it. Uh, but we do have some easier growing fruits that you may want to start out with before getting into fruit tree production. Things like blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, uh, muscadines. I mean, there's not much easier than muscadine to grow. 
Uh, pruning it, on the other hand, is a little more laborious task. Uh, but we do have some fruits that may be something you want to look into when you're just getting started out to see if you even like fruit production. Or if maybe you'd rather save that for somebody else and focus on another task on your farm or your property. Uh, so I was, Tony may be on or online or maybe uh, joining us later. He's got some blueberries. Uh, he has a blueberry production and a pick farm. And so I was hoping to get him to come talk about that. Um, so we may wait and see if he comes later. We'll go ahead and get into our fruit tree pruning. Um, so we have here, what do we have here, Ron? Five-year-old apple tree is called an early harvest. Uh, that's what it does. It's an early harvest tree. It comes uh, harvest will be somewhere around uh, mid-August to the end of August. First, and some of them, like the wine sap, will be more like uh, September or end of September. Mm -hmm. So, with our apple trees, we treat them a lot like our pear trees. Apples and pears are very similar in the way we want them to produce. Uh, we want to identify, and is that what you've got tagged up here? Is our that's, you see these red tags? That's the leader. That's our main central leader. So that's that's the guy that we want up top leading the way. So he's going to be, we tag him so that we can make sure that he stays leading, that he is the guy that the main trunk that all of our branching is going to come off of. How do you know what's the leader? Is it the thickest? Well, you've got it. No tree is perfect. Yeah. So they're all different characters, just like people. They're different. Okay. But if you look at the one I chose here, and we've, we've, we've trained these for some time, it's more of a central part of the tree. It's a strong branch. Uh, you don't want a leader coming out this way, this way. So you want, a, you want the, the apple tree to be uh, symmetrical. Around, and you choose your leader. Uh, if it's centered or a little bit off center, so it's a strong branch coming off the, the main trunk. And then the others, uh, you got to trim back. And that's why you see some of those as a leader. And some, this, this, some of these are too high. And these, if I try to keep them about 18 inches below the leader. And, uh, why, and, do, why do we have a leader? And, and this is where our main point of growth is going to happen. And so when we prune away from him, we get a lot of lateral growth. We don't want him to get tall, 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 and the sides to get too wide. We want to be able to pick. And so we want to be able to reach what we can easily. And so with our main leader, that's where our, we've talked about kind of growing points, but that's where our main um, apical growing point is. That's where all, of, and all it's telling it down below it is to not grow as wide, as vigorous. And so it helps keep us contained. So when we're looking at keeping our central leader, um, and we, it's good to flag it because otherwise we may lose it, right? We might cut them off. Happens sometimes. And the other reason I've got the trainees out here is I, I did I did the leader myself, so they don't have to say, "Well, where's the leader at?" You know, so that gives them a kind of a bearing. That's going to be the leader, and the others got to be subservient. So as we try to build scaffolding around the leader. And when we talked about scaffolding, we we're talking about layers of branches. So with our Ooh. apples and our pears, we want to form a scaffold around the leader. Uh, we don't want to have, uh, say, like our peaches, and we'll get to the they have what we call an open base. They have an open center, and that's the way they prefer to grow. With apples and pears, it's different. We've got our one central leader and we're creating our scaffolding. You can see down here, this is would be our first scaffold of branches. And how many do you usually keep, Ron? This is probably, a, this is too many. I, mean, I think this year I'm probably gonna take out, I'll leave this in later, and I'm gonna take out maybe this one. Yeah. So I'd have about three or four on the bottom. And then try to get up, and this tree's young yet, and try to get another three or four, maybe halfway up, and then the final one, uh, subservient to the leader, like it is up there. You see these two big branches here that we just scaffold. So we want a little bit of space in between our scaffolding. So anything that's coming out from here, we're getting rid of because we don't have that space. What that allows us to have is airflow and sunlight getting into the canopy. We had a bunch of bushy branches all over. There won't be any room for air to move through it, which is very important for what? Disease. Preventing diseases. So if we don't have airflow, that's why when we plant all our Leland cypresses right on top of each other and they get all these disease problems, because there's no room for air movement. Those leaves can't dry off. It also blocks out sunlight. So if we don't have sunlight coming in, we're not gonna get our good pollination, our good fruit production. So having those scaffolds helps us have room in between our 
producing branches. So like Ron said, we establish our first set of scaffolds when they're young. And then as they train and they grow up, we establish our second, our third. Do we really go beyond three scaffolds? Depends on this is a semi dwarf tree. If you have a standard tree, yes, you could go up. Our standard tree could get up to be 20 feet. Some semi dwarfs, site keepers are 12, 13 feet. And then you have dwarf trees, which are about 8 or 10 feet. So uh, about three scaffolds uh, is probably would good. be about and all then, this one would right. take, yeah. Because it, like you said, it's semi dwarf. So it's not going to get quite as big as some of our regular apple trees. Now, you could let it get really tall, but you also have to have a way to pick it. Okay, so that's something to think about. If you can't get up to 20 feet, you know, it, it may not be worth having the fruit up that high because who's going to get it, Ron? But number two, the, you know, the birds, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to get there quickly. Go down a hill, and, and unless you have a cherry picker, Fortunate to have something you have, well, you're fine. But don't. And your ladder's like this. Uh, if you're like me, you don't like to get on a ladder when it's coming up. So uh, you try to keep the trees down to as long as possible. Uh, like I say, so the semi dwarf uh, is about 12, 12 feet, 13, 13 feet. Mm -hmm. And you can know if your trees are dwarf, semi dwarf, et cetera. When you buy them, they should tell you what type of tree it is. So you know how big it's gonna get. We always need to plan for the mature size of any plant that we buy. So when we're looking at pruning, uh, we talked about cleaning out the middle. That's very important. Any branches that are going in, any branches that are rubbing against each other, that's one of the first things we look at because we don't want any branches that are going into the middle of our canopy. We're trying to keep that cleaned out. We also don't want any branches that are gonna rub against each other like these may eventually rub against each other, that's gonna create a wound that may not heal and that'll leave it open to disease and insect pests. So when we're looking at it, what would be one of your first pets you'd make here, Ron? <clears throat> these light colored, uh, get the easy ones first, these light colored uh, branches over here. This is all new growth right in here. And you can see the difference in the, the color. Center. These are called water sprouts. And they're not gonna produce hardly any fruit, if any. So if you want to get in here and take it right by the collar and nip those, uh, nip all these out. They're just not going to produce soup. There's a collar over here. Y'all can come up closer collar. if you want. We don't bite, I promise. You can't really damage a tree unless, you know, you don't use the tree to, to uh, uh, too shallow. But you can see kind of where a collar is at. What you want to do is just kind of get it about a quarter inch from that collar. You can get it to something like that. It's a little, little heavy. This one here, too. So just kind of clean it all up. Uh, now, the other thing that, that you want to be careful of, even though there's some, some trees are down, see these little guys here? These are called spurs. That's where your fruit's coming. All these little ones here. There's going to be fruit on each one of these. But and sometimes, like this is what you said, this is going to be hitting this tree over here. It's this limb here. I'll take, I'll take that one out. And I mean, all these have to be, you can see, those are really big. I mean, this thing is filled out. You can see how much we took out. We're going to take out about probably at least 50% uh, of it. And then cut it down, cut the top down to about 18 inches to go that leaf. Are you going to hurt the tree by doing that? The only way you can, you can't hurt the tree. The only way you can hurt the tree, let's say that I wanted to take <clears throat> this limb off. And it's pretty good size there. And if you cut it over here, you now this is going up, but if you cut it over here, you might just, if you cut it, you're going to scrape this tree down over here. Now that's the damage of the tree, and it's just going to have insects and everything. So what you'd want to do there is, I'm not going to cut it. Saw, the pruning saw. So, in order not to damage a tree, I'm not going to do it over here for this one, but you make a tri cut. The three cut method? Three. So the first thing you do is get about six inches away and cut it on the bottom about halfway through. So, it's got a, it's, it's, it's halfway through that. Then you go up about another two inches and cut it over here. So, what that's going to do is if it, if it uh, sheds the bark, you're going to cut this off anyway. But then that really is the weight. We made the first cut, second cut, then you can come over here about a dollar and third cut. But then you can have all that weight there. If you had the weight on here and you cut it down over here, you could damage 
It would snap and peel that bark off. That, that would yeah, so any large limb, not just fruit trees, that three cut method. And it's safer for you as well than just coming in here and cutting and having it snap and maybe hit you in the face or something like that. You can control it a little bit more. So like Ron said, we've got our water sprouts here. So any of these, we want to get and remove them. And as close back to the trunk to that branch collar, you can see it here, that bark looks a little bit different. We don't want to make flush cuts. Flush cuts do not heal like we want them to. They don't form what we call callus tissue. I'm looking back at some of these cuts. Some of these cuts have really good callus tissue formed on them, which means it kind of covers over that wound. With trees, they don't heal. They just compartmentalize. So what they do is they block this cut off from the rest of the tree and it just decays. So what we're hoping to do is we may come back and cut this a little bit closer to that collar. And what we're hoping is that callus tissue swells up and covers that wound up so that it's not open to any disease or insect pests. So when we're making our cuts, we're making sure that we're making good clean cuts up to the collar. Um, or if we're taking out whole, uh, taking out a limb, part of a limb, we're going back to a growing point. Usually when I'm selecting growing points, I select buds that are going out. So when we're looking at making these cuts, let's just say, for example, we're going to cut this guy. If I wanted to keep part of this limb, I wouldn't cut it back necessarily to this bud because it's kind of going up and potentially could rub into any of these branches that are already coming out. I may make the cut back here. See this bud right here? It would put a limb out. So what's happening is when we're making those cuts, kind of like we talked about with the central leader, kind of controlling everything. Right now, the tip of that branch is where all that growth is happening. When I cut it off, all the growth is going to happen at the next bud, the one that's right below my cut. That's where all the new growth is going to happen. So when we make those pruning cuts, it's telling that next latent or lateral bud to grow. So when I'm making cuts with these, I want to make sure I'm pruning it to buds that are going to go outward not inward because that's what we're trying to avoid that inward growth so that we don't have a lot of branches in the middle and we don't have that rubbing and crossing on the branch. How much by size do you take down Ron? I'll take down about a third. I'll look at the leader over there and get underneath that and then I'll take down about a third from the main branch to that one or sometimes a half because that's all new growth and just going straight up. So if you want to get you want to get the tree shaped, and the other thing is, this, this tree is kind of leaning this way. No tree is perfect, but you want to kind of keep it symmetrical if you can with the scaffolding. Because if you get, and I've got some down there, if you get too much on this side, like this is growing too much, I'm going to take more out on this side because this one doesn't have so much. So I'm going to probably go over here and probably take this one out, or this one, and, and like these over here, if you can imagine fruit going on this this limb here. What's going to happen when you get about five apples in? It'll go like that. And it'll probably tear the grass. So, this is why I call a downer. Get all the downer. Get the easy ones first. Get all the water sprouts out. These over here are going on the inside. You can see the difference in the, the new growth. See the difference in the, uh, uh, the bark color. color. The so, it's like all of All these over here that's growing inside. Anything going like, 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 uh, like Tracy said, anything going the inside is going to take it. Anything going the inside, all these got to go. And they're weak anyway. If any downers, call a downer got to go because, you know, where's the fruit going to go? It's down over here. So, so let's say we had a down branch like this. Would you prune it back to where it could go up? This one, if, if uh, it's starting to go up, and like, like she said, you can you can print it over here, and then there's a it's going to start growing this way. Sure, it might get too close. Notice how she did about a quarter inch here and kind of at an angle. And where this uh, this bud is here, so that's going to force the growth. All the energy is going to start going this way, and that's what we wanted to do. If she cut it back where the bud's going this way, well, where is it going to go? Inside. It's not good. So, like I say, this tree is way too heavy on this side, so mm -hmm. I'm going to probably do about half of this stuff out. This is a good branch. Pick your weak branches. This is a weaker one. I'll probably take that out. And uh, you see all these rubbing against, get the easy ones first. Get all these little branches all the way. And then you kind of step back, <laughs> walk around the tree, take a look at it, and try again. You, you can't really do it all at one time. You just kind of- Take it know, out a piece at a time. Yeah, just, just look at it, do a little bit, come back and look at it, and just try to get that shape. Yeah. <laughs> I always tell them it's like, uh, for those of us who pluck our eyebrows, you don't want to just keep go at it, not taking a step back and look at what you've done. 
because then you'll end up with like half an eye <laughs> and you may not may have a little bit more than you wanted to so it's always good to take a step back and reflect and look at what you've done but like ron said you're not going to kill the trees by being a little too aggressive with your fruit now you can kill a tree by ripping the bark off you know messing with the bark uh but they don't mind being whacked back they prefer it they're going to be more vigorous producers imagine if you left all this on here and what little You'd have a lot of fruit, but it'd be little fruit. I have an apple about this big. You can't hurt it. You, you, you should prune more than you think you should. It's just not going to hurt the tree. No. When's the last time that was pruned? Is that like just one year? Well, we prune when the dormant season, unless you've got, uh, so this was pruned last year, about, the last course, about a year February, ago. about a year ago. And if you've got, uh, uh, any kind of disease, you prune that any time. Try to take that out, especially if it can get on fire blight. But I had an infection of fire blight over here, and that's a virus, and and it, you can't eradicate it. But uh, for fire blight, if you see fire blight anywhere, and you can tell a fire blight it looks like the shepherd's hook when you got the leaves on it here. It just got a, it turns down this way like a shepherd's hook, and it'll be dead over here. Now that you got to be very careful. With. That means you you, you, you got to come back over here to where there's a uh, green growth. And cut it back over here and disinfect your pruning. Because if you cut it over here and you look at another tree, you're just spreading that thing all around. So fire blight is you can read about it. Fire blight is a really tough one to eradicate. Mm -hmm. What variety is this? Oh, sorry, I missed it. This, this is called an early harvest variety. Yeah, these are all heirloom varieties. Yeah, this is I don't have the signs off here. This was back about 1840 of the variety that was planted. And we're planting the same variety, not the same tree, but the same variety. Yeah, all of these are heirloom that with the Carter House, they try to keep things back to what would have been growing here uh, at that time. And so these are all heirloom apple and peach varieties. That's what we're doing here. Now, now when you're starting your own orchard, uh, look at what's resistant to disease. Mm -hmm. You don't have to spray so much. Like I got to spray these things because it's really good. I don't have trees because they're not resistant. You know, like the bread delicious and the granny smiths and all that sort of thing. But look at those and, and you won't have to spray as much. Do you do so you preventative can... spraying? Yeah. 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 Spraying is best done preventative. Yeah. That's what we're, our goal is. After you have fire blight or after you have cedar out for us, you can't get rid of it once you have it. So all your spraying is best done preventatively. If you've got apple trees and you've got cedar trees nearby, chances are you're probably going to have cedar out for us. It's probably good to go ahead and get your trees on a spray regimen so you don't have to worry about it once that comes along. But like Ron saying, these are heirloom varieties. And we talked about that with seed saving is heirlooms are great because you can save seeds and uh, grow from that and be true to the parent plant. But the problem with heirlooms is, is there's not disease resistance spread into them like some of our newer varieties. So when you're growing these newer varieties, a lot of them have been bred to be resistant to say, cedar apple rust, fire blight, scab. Those are probably our top three apple diseases. And so when you have those varieties that are resistant, doesn't mean they're not going to ever get it. They're a lot less likely, and you don't have to do as much spraying. Yeah, read up on what you're putting in and put in some that are just especially if you've got you know, cedar trees like that there. That's a no no. Cedar apple rust, you're going to get that. And I got it. I will say, you there. probably get it. Yeah, I yep. got, a, got a spray farm. The other thing you asked a question about preventative spraying, one of the most important things you could do is right now, anytime in February or March, you do what's called a dormant oil spray. And what that does is it, it, it'll smother. And I use a surfactant, which is like a soap solution, with just a little bit. It's a, it's a soap that makes it stick to the tree more. So what that does is the overwintering scale or anything like that, that'll smother that. And that's the preventative thing that you, you don't, you know, you can do a lot of uh, good just by doing that one spray or two if you want to. So it's, it's a horticulture, like you can get bone-eyed, Fruit tree spray later on uh, for uh, uh, for uh, for what's called cover sprays, but this first spray, uh, one of different brands, it's called Dormant or Horticulture Oil. And uh, for these trees, I like to add a little bit of copper to it. So the Dormant oil is for insects, and copper is for the disease. Uh, that's the spray you do the very first spray of the season, mm -hmm. sometime in February while it's dormant. And you pick a couple days in a row where it's about at least 40 degrees Fahrenheit in you know no rain for 24 or 48 hours because it doesn't do any good if it's 25 degrees it's not going to do any good it's got to be at least 40 to 50 degrees 
or just going and to the And it'll say that on the label. Yeah, you just read the label. Is that like a neem oil or is it? No, neem oil is organic. It's a, what this cost, what is it? With, oh, with horticulture oil? Yeah, I'm yeah. not 100% it's, sure what that. They call it oil, but it's not really oil. It's not, it's not oil. Yeah, so it's usually like a dormant oil. Yeah. 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 A, It'll say horticulture oil. Yeah, I wouldn't use a, a real, what's called oil, oil spray on that. People have done it. I be, uh, and horticulture oil is uh, organic as well. Yeah. Uh, they have organic options. So if you are trying to do organic, and it can be used later on in the year for. We talked, uh, we'll talk about with vegetable production, but um, aphids, some of our insect control, horticulture oils work well for those applications. So you can use it for multiple things. Should but, you put any, oh, you're right, no. Should you, well, after you cut it, should you put anything on? No. 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 Don't want to do that. No. Nope. Like, to, you can, a lot of people say, well, you got to protect it with, uh, with you know, they got sprays and you put a black spray on it. That doesn't do the tree any good. The tree's got to heal. And it's like putting a band aid on your arm. You keep the band aid on it, your arm, it's not going to heal. You got to have air coming through it. So uh, uh, you leave it and let nature take its course, and it'll crust over. If you have a limb, it'll crust over. And it'll take maybe this a couple years. This is a great example of calyx right here. There yeah. used to be a limb here. You right. see the swollen area? That's what we want to happen. Now we want that callus tissue to form. And it'll do that in a healthy Keeping your trees healthy is the best defense against anything making sure that they have good moisture that you're pruning them correctly but those sprays and those tanks and those you know uh limb things things you can put on your limbs and cover up any wounds and pruning uh cuts not effective there's there's been no research that has shown that those actually even help the tree and they can sometimes hurt the tree like ron said you want the tree to do its own thing you want it to compartmentalize compartmentalize that wound itself and it'll do that on it doesn't need to. The, one of the things uh, too is important uh, is, uh, is common sense. You want the bees to help you. You want the insects, the insects to help you. So you don't spray any insecticide until after all the blooms are done. Because that's just going to self -feed. You know, after the blooms are, are finished, that's when you can apply your insecticide. And sometimes a systemic insecticide works really well. So if that goes into the ground and systemic comes up and it goes all the way through. So that's one of the, uh, the uh, I do that right after the, uh, the, the blooms are done. Uh, I have a, uh, a systemic insecticide and that, that helps prevent stuff for later on too. When you, uh, you know, like, like you said, once you get a, a, a insect or disease, it's hard to eradicate. It's best to do preventative as best you can. Sometimes you can't do it. You just got to deal with what you got. Yeah. And just know that, you know, growing fruit trees, like we talked about earlier, is difficult. So you're not always going to get perfect fruit off of your trees. And it's okay. If you, if you can eat an apple that has cedar apple rust. It's not going to hurt you. It's just not going to be the most beautiful apple you ever saw. And if you do run into trouble, right over here right in our own backyard, we've got a diagnostic team. If you just you take a cutting, you don't know what it is, they're going to tell you what it is and what's the best to spray for. That's what we're here for. That's it. Yep. I've used them many times. <laughs> and, and, and there are things that you can know ahead of time by knowing you have apple trees, things that you can do. We have <coughs> publications. We have a great spray guide that tells you what to spray when. It also gives some organic options if, if you're wanting to do it organically. Uh, but on there, it's going to talk about, you know, never, we're not spraying any insecticides when a tree is blooming because pollinators are doing, doing that work and we don't want to impede them at all. So look at those, and on that utfort.com, I've mentioned several times, uh, but on that website, you can find all of these spray guides, pruning guides, uh, fruit publications, and I've got a couple of publications here for those that came late. Don't forget to get them on blueberries and craneberries, or craneberries, caneberries. Uh, do you want to show them a peach tree real quick? Yeah, let's go down and gather this. Can, can I ask a question here? Looking at this tree right here, what is the most difficult cut that maybe some of us would not know to cut? Difficult cut would be it's a good limb, but for instance, this one here, it's just it's a lot of busy work here. And I didn't cut this out before. Sometimes you can't do it all in one year. If you don't know, just let it go for the next year. The difficult one is choosing well, should I get this one or should I do this one? 
you kind of stand back and look at the reason I'm going to say this one is because there's two reasons for it. You see this, there's another reason here. See this here, this is like a V. This is a weak spot. You think it's, it's, it's uh, strong, it's not. The Vs are weak spots. When it's like a U, this is strong. If you got weight on it, it's going to hold it. This one, if it gets, if it gets apples on it, it's, it might take off this, and then it's going to do damage to the tree because it's going to rip it off. So I would probably, you have to decide, you know, where, uh, which one you want to do, uh, uh, and then kind of stand around the tree and say, okay, try to get it symmetrical. Don't get all the weight on one side, because then the apples are going to try to do like this, and this is happens. You get wind blowing on you. It's got apples on it, and the tree goes back. Why is that happen? So you you, uh, you you pick, you stand back and pick the limbs that are that are weaker and the ones that, that really you don't need. And this is too busy. But uh, uh, like Taylor said, you, you need to open this up for some airspace. And let the sunlight come through. Sunlight and airspace very important. More important for peaches than apples. Mm -hmm. Still very important. Yeah. And, and you can see, and you can come up and look. All these that have that narrow, what we call crotch angles, they've got what we call included bark. And that's a weak attachment. Pears and um, apples are notorious for it because you see their new growth goes straight up. So a lot of times they form those weak angles, those weak crotch angles. And so picking those limbs may fail later on. That's going to be important. We like the U shape. Like this, not a V. Mm -hmm. This, um, this is a weak one here, so I'll probably go ahead and uh, have you have ever weighted limbs on apples to keep them straight? Yeah, you can do that yeah. Too. so when apples grow, a lot of times they want to go straight up. So when they're young, you can take limbs, these are too big now, but you can weight them or put a spacer between them and the main <coughs> limb and help them grow out instead of up. Um, so you can hang a weight off the end of it because right now it's pretty flexible. I mean, they wouldn't do it to this one, but right now it's pretty flexible. So it can kind of train it to grow the way we want it by putting a weight on the end of that limb or putting a spacer so that it doesn't grow too upright. Close. Close, close in, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, want it, you want something to grow out a little more, just stick close in and uh, let it start going. And just leave it there. Okay. And then after about six weeks, take it out. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll start so farming where you want to go. Out instead of up. Uh, it's not, see, there's no branches. I'm not going to do this. Here, but <laughs> oh, yeah. There's no branches over here. So I could demonstrate over here. But if you want a branch in a small tree, you start from there. What to do is just make a cut. It's not going to hurt the tree. And make another cut over here. Doesn't take much. That will start a new branch right here. There's going to be a lot of energy anytime you cut something like that. There's going to be some energy wanting to go through here, and there'll be a branch. There could be a branch, and it's kind of empty here. Mm -hmm. There could be a branch, it's going to take a while, but there'll be a little branch starting out over here oh and start going out. So, if you want to try to do that sometime, this is a perfect tree to do that because it's empty over here. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd want to do. Just, cut a, little, on this just cut a little, just a little indentation, and that's going to do, have the, have the energy amazing. force that right over here. And starting to go out, so you can do that. Too. That's adventitious. We call those adventitious, whether it's roots or stems or whatever. Those are adventitious growth, uh, because, like you said, like Ron said, there's going to be a lot of energy that goes that point because you've just taken these cells and cut them off, and now they're like, well, what do I do now? Well, maybe I'll form a new limb, and so all those cells start forming into new stem cells instead of making stems instead of just one. You want to go show them a peach tree real quick? Yeah, completely different way we pruned it. Pears are like apples. Pears and apples are the same, and then peaches, plums, nectarines, all of those are cherries. Yeah, cherries are like so peaches. There's just two different categories. You got mm -hmm. a pear, and without a pit, uh, you prune it with a leader. Pears, apples, got a leader. Small and easy to prune. I've got Really old that are special. We have a great presentation on pruning neglected fruit. Yes. I didn't neglect them out there. I just thought that I was looking in there. It happened, and I thought it didn't have a patient because people get by and have neglected trees that they need to rehab. Mm -hmm. 
here until we get down over here. Those are peach trees. You see, we don't have a flag. That's not what we're looking at with peach trees. We want about four or five, maybe less, really strong main limbs. And then we just keep that center cleaned out because they are so, so disease prone, much more so than our apples. Uh, you'll find it a lot harder to get peaches to produce here than you will apple trees. Um, and that's also just the way they prefer to grow. We keep them much shorter as well. Uh, we keep, well, how tall do you keep yours about? Well, those are too tall. It should be uh, a little higher than about 12 feet. Yes. Most of your commercial growers are keep, will keep them at like six to 10 feet max, usually around six, seven feet. It's easier to pick that way. And so they just end up removing older branches and keeping new vigorous branches that are going to produce more fruit. So in these, the ideal, we're not, we're not getting that central leader. We don't, you don't see the flags like you do in the apples because that's not how they're going to grow. We cut out that and we keep those main, we right here, we've got three basically main limbs and we keep the center cleaned out. So how much of this tree did you remove when you started? Well, it was like that. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the bottom there, mm -hmm. that's an unpruned tree. That's a tree tree. So you, you can like see, you yeah, there, you cut out and you're not going to kill the tree. It is going to be much happier for the pruning that you do on it than it would be if you just left it and left all those limbs on it. If anything's growing in the inside, mm -hmm. take it all out. Yeah. And you'll make it a nice cut. And you can see the cut she made here, here, here. These trees are very big. In one year, you're going to get, like those down there, you're going to get, you know, hundreds of these little limbs coming out. So you're going to have to take them out. These trees are more, uh, You've got to prune more, it takes more time to prune the peach tree than that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I point out is the peach tree, you think of it like a fan. Mm -hmm. Those are feet that are firm. One peach tree looking something like a fern. So it's kind of spread out just like you get a fern going here. You see these limbs going this way. So if you had some uh, limbs going this way or going this way, this is coming down. This is sort of hurting. Uh, you want to remove all this. So it's more. Lateral, yeah, lateral like an yeah. open fan that's going all around because it's catching all of that sunlight. How many peaches do we produce this year? Uh, this year, squirrels don't get them. Well, yeah, we've <laughs> got a problem with the squirrel population over here. So they love those things. So if they would leave them go, I could probably have, uh, oh, I'd say about uh, half a bushel. Yeah. A bushel How old is on that? that? How old is that tree? Pardon me? How old is that tree? This one's by one year number four. And this is a variety of this like thing. These are, uh, it's called red, red Indian Clean, Blood Indian Clean. And this is a tree that dates back to the 1600s. And it's very big and it wants to grow tall. And that's why you see those tall over there. Most of the peach trees you can keep. Like this guy wants to really grow. So just got to keep at it and keep, keep it down as much as it can be. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, uh, it's a nice variety of peach, but it's probably one that you may not, you may not want to grow. Uh, it, it's just hard to keep contained. You want one like, uh, like she said, where you know you have an eight to ten feet or something, and, and uh, they can grow. You plenty of variety there. Oh yeah, we've got so many varieties. Uh, one of the most important things when you're choosing peach varieties are chill hours, and chill hours—that's the average temperature that we get down to. Usually, they they rate it. I think it's forty to forty-five around the how many nights we get or how many days we get that cold. And so with chill out chill hours, we get 
I don't know what our average was last year. In the, yeah, do you know, remember our chill yeah. hours? In the thousands. We get quite a few chill hours. Most of our peach trees are rated. You'll go online. They'll say the chill hours beside them. Like 750, 900. It's too low. We're too cold for those peaches. They'll start blooming after they've get, gotten all their chill hours. They'll say, now it's time to grow. Now it's time to bloom. And then they'll get hit by a cold. We want some high chill hour peaches. So that is the key when you're picking peach varieties is chill hours and then also the disease resistance. Brown rot's probably our most destructive disease on peaches. And it's not like cedar apple rust. You aren't gonna eat a peach after it has brown rot. I mean, it's 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 pretty gross. Have y'all ever seen brown rot? Yeah, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brown rot is a tough disease. And, you know, we get quite a few insect pests with them as well. So looking for those varieties that have that disease resistance built in and then getting ones that have uh, chill hours, the high chill hours that we need for our area when you're choosing varieties. And we have um, online some great lists that Dr. Lockwood has put together. He's our fruit specialist um, for the university, has put together on variety selection for these fruit trees. Uh, so you can look on there and get some that have those qualities that we talked about. Yeah. Question. Um, two things actually. I noticed long slope here. Are these trees planted here intentionally, or just the, the only spot available? Spot available. <laughs> and and, and uh, our spacing here. What's the spacing? Uh, I try to get it about sixteen inches, uh, sixteen feet off the But uh, uh, this area here, this is uh, this is owned by the state, and this used to be the old Franklin Road. Okay. And, and there was there was concrete bleaching. But you had no place else to go. You had to do this. So some of these trees had to move over to the side. You tried to dig in the back. <laughs> so, you know, you have to, there's, there's more. You just kind of have to work around it. But uh, yeah, this is where we wanted. This is all we wanted to do with this. And this is protected land. So we can't go digging in there. In there you got to get a state permit for that. Thing. It's protected. But uh, another thing you want to teach us are very, you're going to have tons of mm -hmm. You don't want that. Because your peaches are going to be up the side of the edge quarter or something so you're going to have to do a lot of thinning on these peaches and we try to thin maybe have one peach or two peaches about every six inches and just pluck the other ones out because otherwise you're not going to do that and you can what size do you do that at yeah uh, so after there's you did that once the food is there about the size of a nickel okay it was really small yet Okay. You don't want to let them because the, if you let them go any bigger, you're using up the energy of the tree, and and you're not going to have any. And you get peaches out of them. Uh, I'm trying to think here, there's a difference between a a uh, peach which is going to have peaches versus one that's a wood bud. Oh yeah. And so I don't know. You can kind of see this over here. So you you have you have a leaf that's going to grow in the center, mm -hmm. and these are peach buds. So you can have peach buds on each side with a leaf in the center. As opposed to a leaf bud, you know, these are leaf buds. There's no, and they're, they're going to have branches coming out of it. So uh, you, you try, if you want the peach uh, to be formed, you go on a leaf bud. And like Taylor said, you go to the outside. So you, you, you get one kind of going here this way. You don't want to have one coming this way because it's going to grow back and you have to cut it off. But that's this is a typical uh, uh, bud for the uh, people. So you have these two, one on each side, and then the leaf. So one of those two will be pulled. <coughs> they, these were both going to be peaches. Because you don't want them growing that close to each other. So you no, you can. You can uh, well, when, when, they, when they start, yeah, you're going to have to take one out. You can take one on this side or that side. You can have okay. you can have a cluster of a couple. You know, you don't have to have one here, one here. You can have clusters. But if you get six it's or eight, too many on the whole. If range. you got six or eight, you're gonna forget about that. Do we let them? Let's say that someone planted a new tree. Do we let it fruit for no, a few years? I, it's probably not gonna fruit anyway. But I would. Uh, the fruit's gonna take up energy in the tree, so it's best. If you ain't gonna have much. If you want a peach right away? I guess it wouldn't hurt. But it's <laughs> probably best to uh, not let it fruit. And let it just grow a couple of years and get get a good root structure to it, because uh, all these trees here are uh, are I call the whips. They're they're bare root trees, and so and that's a good thing. You can order the variety you want, and you can get it in the mail. And so the roots are uh, are, are cut off, 
as opposed to buying a, 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 a bald and burlap, I wouldn't do that. I've done that over here. You think, well, I'm going to have a bigger tree and you're going to get fruit. It's going to take just as long for that one to produce fruit as it is for one like this. Because just common sense again, your, your root structure has been cut out. And you got some limb structure, but your root structure, you got to have a balance between the roots and, and the limbs. And uh, like I say, this is going to grow, this is going to produce fruit just as easy as that. And that's gonna be stunted for a while if you get uh, one in a container for mm -hmm. bald and burlap. I tried both of them. Dr. Lockwood says, no, don't get bald and burlap. Fair yeah. get, get what you want. You can order what you want, you know, the varieties that you want and get them through the mail or you can pick them up at the nursery center that are, uh, that, that don't, you know, they're not uh, bald and burlap trees. Get uh, the bare root trees. Then you come up with a whip. The other thing, people look at Lockwood you have a tree and he gets it. <laughs> and it's over here and it's got some nice, nice scaffold starting. Put it down over here. And the first thing he does, he whacks it. He goes, mm -hmm. tuk, 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 tuk. he leaves it right over here and it's a stick. That's it. One stick in the ground. Where you want to start? That's where you start. Start about hip height for uh, apples and a little bit lower for peaches. You can see that's where we started our branches down here. That when you get them in, you, you want to train it to how you want it to grow. So you're cutting it back. It's not going to kill it. Now you're getting it back to that main trunk and then you're starting from there. How do you stop slow. It, how is it not fruit? How do you stop it from fruiting? You just peel the fruit yeah, and you start pulling fruit. Just pull it. The little buds you just pull it. Because that's where all that energy is going towards producing that fruit. And it's it's going to take away from establish and we really want these to establish good root systems first before it starts really putting on that fruit. Give it a couple of years. You get a like a one year old tree, you get a two year old tree. And it'll be a just a stick to put in the ground. And uh give it a couple of years first and then you know what you'll see it start going you can start pruning it. And then the third year you probably should get some peaches and then it's gonna just multiply itself big time, you know, after yeah. the fourth or fifth year. So spraying the trees whenever you're not getting fruit or you're not worried about getting fruit those first few years, is your spraying wildly different or are you still having, you're yeah. still having to connect yeah. it from yeah. cedar rust and everything? Or not, okay. Like I said, I got to spray these more often um, because they're just old arrow trees. And the uh, soil here is uh, just not good. It's such a heavy tree. Everybody knows pH, right? Mm -hmm. It started out uh, early over here about, uh, well, about nine years ago, 10 years ago, and the pH was uh, right at eight, 7.9. Unbelievable. If you don't get, these trees, these, these, all these trees should have a pH of about 6.5, maybe 6.8 every year. The way you get pH down is you add sulfur or aluminum sulfide. Now I'm older, I'm putting sulfur on and I'm aluminum sulfide and it goes down from 7.8 to 7.7. 7. Next year, 7.7 <laughs> 7 to 7.5. I just took a soil sample here, uh, uh, took it in uh, February, early February, and for the first time since I've been here, I finally have these trees down to about 6'9", 6, 6, 6, 6, and if you have too high a pH, you're not going to get the nutrients, it's gonna, the nutrients are not going to come up, they're, 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 it's just blocked in the soil. So you got to get that pH down, and the only way to do that is to take your soil test, you want to do a soil test. And, and uh, take it to the egg center, uh, Milligan. We do, and then you get it back, and then you have more information than you want to know. But at least you know, the pH, they tell you what nutrients to do, and a good guide for that. So, soil samples are important to take. Even before you put your trees in, you can get a soil sample there. You can, you can adapt the soil to what you want to put first. Just like any crops, you guys can offer some soil. Uh, and we talk about placement and um, Ideally, we don't have fruit trees down in the bottom of a valley. And that's where a lot of our cool air will settle. Now, apples and all that, you know, they can be a little more amenable to the to the cool weather. But ideally, but have you had any problems? No, I haven't had the problems I have is in Tennessee. It's good for whiskey because you have 75 degrees one day and 35 the next day. And whiskey goes in and out of the barrel, and that's fine. It's not good for peach trees. If you got a small tree, and I've done this before, you get you get you might if you don't have many, get some free spot. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if you're gonna have the buds on it and the blooms are out, and here comes uh, April the 10th, and all of a sudden you got a 25 degree day, yeah, there goes your fruit production. So if you, if you can, now if you got a bunch of you can't do it, well, you just you know, it is what it is. You just gotta let Mother Nature do its thing. That's it. 
but if you got small trees and just got a few, you might want to invest in some freeze cloth and that way you protect it and get the tree, you know, so it's not too tall and you can get it, you know, get it down to uh, let the uh, freeze won't hurt. But when it's a 65 degree day and, and then it comes down below freezing, it's just really hard on the More hard, it's harder on the peach trees. The apple trees are a little more hardy, but they can withstand the peach trees. And planting on slopes is, is fine. As you can see, these, these fruit trees are doing fine planting on the slopes. You don't have to have a nice, even flat ground. No, they'll be all right. Another reason for keeping the tree down because, you know, how are you going to pick the fruit? <laughs> the slope. <laughs> Unless you got a cherry pepper. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you, you shouldn't have two different varieties. Mm -hmm. Multiple varieties. At least two. There's seven varieties of, uh, of apple trees here. All of the seven were what was planted in 1870. That's what we planted here. And uh, not only that, but we got the row water to cut. Now there's over 400 trees. I've got 67. But uh, uh, no, you need you need more than one variety. It's better for cross pollination. Mm -hmm. but, the, but these trees, uh, you don't have to have male and female. The, uh, I can't tell you what, what, what uh, what fruit tree needs it. The, the, there are ones that are have complete flowers and ones that have incomplete flowers. Uh, but for most of our apples and pears, uh, you just need multiple varieties for pollination. Cross pollination is key. So, and, and that's the same with blueberries. That's Tony up there. That's the same with blueberries. We want multiple varieties of blueberries. So we get that cross pollination uh, that gives us that good production of fruit. And we even have some uh, self-fertile fruits like figs they don't need anything else just themselves but our fruit trees you're gonna it's gonna be better to have multiple varieties and it's important to look at when they bloom we have early and late bloomers and so not having them blooming at the same time is important so that the pollen's open what other questions do you have so you start pruning right away like the first in its first year yeah, you prune it when you put it underground. You prune it. If you got a bare root tree, you prune right. it so there's just a quick. And then each year, if, if you're on top of it, well, this tree is pretty good. Uh, I've learned over the years. I said, oh my gosh, I don't want more than that. You don't want more than that. Just try to get it. It's, it's pretty balanced. You want to balance. Sometimes you feel bad about this. You don't want to take this out. <laughs> but it's better for the tree. You know, if you've got too much limb on one time, you know, just, just make your good cuts. And, uh, Try to get it balanced and keep that open center. Open center has got to have a lot of wind, a lot of sunlight. If you don't have that, you're not going to be consistent. What do you recommend? I've seen a lot of different watering systems. Like if you do not have the ability to have irrigation, um, yeah, well, I've, I've seen not, like water diaper type things around. I've I'm seen not lots of those things. I don't know. The first year, maybe if we were in a drought situation, but those just encourage the roots to stay in one spot. You want those roots to go out searching for water. If you keep water in one spot, that's where they're going to sit. So if you don't have if you don't have irrigation, you can hand water in in need. But hopefully after that first year or so, they've gotten established enough that they're not going to need a whole, whole lot of supplemental. I do have the first some. Year. See the spaghetti tube. I've got irrigation, mm -hmm. underground irrigation, so that helps uh, helps me over here. And this is uh, it just sprays out uh, you know, water on yeah. the ground. I don't like. Uh, most people, if you have to, you have to. If it's really dry, you got unless you just have a few trees, you want to carry water buckets. I used to do that, carry water buckets from over there. But uh, uh, overhead irrigation leads to fungus. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a sprayer that goes over here like this, and mm -hmm. if that's all you got, that's yeah. what you have to do if, if you need water. But uh, it's best to have uh, some sort of drip irrigation or some sort of ground irrigation, because then the water is over here, it's not coming up. Exactly. Yeah, the water is going to where the roots are taking it up. The leaves aren't taking up water, just the roots. So if we're getting water on the leaves, it's not serving us any purpose, especially if it stays on there overnight and can lead to disease problems. So if you can do micro irrigation rate, right, if you can't, that first couple of years is, is the you know most sensitive time. We really want those roots established well. So keep those well watered, not letting them get over watered. Uh, but if there's a drought situation coming in and supplemental watering, um, other than that, try to plant them near a water source if you can. Uh, that's, you know, that's going to be very helpful. Use a balanced fertilizer. Use a, a, a slow release. Not, not, not just a little lot of uh, 
Pastor Lisa Little on the phone. But uh, we can use it for 12, 12, 12, 12. That's the nursery specials. So they'll pay a little more money for it. It's got a salt coating. And it'll fertilize a tree for maybe eight weeks to 12 weeks. So that's the best you can do. Because it's over time that it produces fertilizer as opposed to a big shot. Mm -hmm. One shot in the arm. Slow release fertilizers. Nope. And you don't have to fertilize all the time. You're just out. Do y'all fertilize here every? Uh, I fertilize it once, once, once in the, probably about April. Once the, uh, uh, the buds are forming and everything, where it can use a lot of energy around April. Yeah. Once or twice a year. I mean, twice that's, max. That's all you need to do. The more you fertilize, the more growth. The <laughs> more you have to keep up with. <laughs> kind of like the grass. The more you fertilize it, the more you have to mow. Yeah, don't over fertilize it. Don't do that. The pH is important. It's pretty pH down. It takes about sulfur doesn't break down. It takes about five months for that. So if you're gonna put the sulfur treated in the fall, and then by uh, March or somewhere on there, that's really effective. So that'll get the pH down. Now if you don't, now the, 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 uh, I've got a problem getting the pH down. Now sometimes if you have too acid soil, then you're gonna have to add calcium. You need to have lime, lime on it so you're able to bring that pH down. That, that window of, of the fruit trees, probably any kind of fruit trees, is about 6, 5, mm -hmm. to 7. And this is slightly acid, not, you know, it's a Goldilocks thing. Not too acidy, not too alkaline, just a little bit. And then it's going to be best for to absorb the nutrients, the micronutrients in the soil. And that's for our fruit trees and some of our fruits like blackberries, strawberries, that's six and a half, slightly acidic rain. Same for vegetable gardens. That's kind of that ideal. And we're very blessed that the majority of our soils are slightly acidic, so we don't have to alter them too much. But this one, <laughs> I don't know what happened here. But an eight, I hardly ever see an eight. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, like that soil expert, you worked with Dow. Maybe it's all the stone. I don't know. But uh, Kevin Brown, he's been yeah? for for Dow at the Box Hill. Anyway, he's a soil expert. He said, "I don't understand why you got this pH so high." <laughs> and and when I took the soil test, uh, this place had uh, it's got uh, calcium carbonate. And there's about an acre here, and I've got 10,000 pounds of calcium carbonate in the top 12 inches of soil. Mm -hmm. And most of you are not going to have that. I've got, and that 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 blocks the nutrients coming up, and it's got a too high pH. That's what I'm trying to get mm -hmm. down. If it's too low pH, then you're going to have to have limestone, lime mm -hmm. Yeah, and in blueberry production, it's completely different. And Tony got our blueberries up, and he can tell you, but that's a five, five and a half. I mean, it's a max. So you're keeping it very acid. <coughs> So doing the soil test is important, knowing where your soil is sitting, because that could be affecting your production. Uh, but with blueberries, I will say it's a lot harder to lower your pH, and you can attest to that too, mm -hmm. than it is to raise your pH. So if you have a soil that's naturally high alkaline, uh, it may be better to consider uh, other options that aren't going to be as- Not, not blueberries. Not you blueberries. Yeah. Yeah. Do you fight Tony? Now I'm, your soil's I'm, pretty good. I, my soil stays pretty pretty close to right at four point eight. Mm -hmm. That's That's great for good yeah. yeah. About the only thing I can grow. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. You do such a good job of it. Right. <laughs> Did you choose blueberries because of your soil being so acidic? Uh, I chose blueberries because we went to a family reunion. <laughs> And my aunt had two blueberry bushes in her backyard, and I've never eaten blueberry in my life. And we ate blueberries, and we've got ten and eight and a half acres we weren't using. So we decided we will try blueberries, and then I started researching for about three or four years before we ever planted any, and had soil tested. And blueberry is what I need to plant. <laughs> Just fake. You had those that's blueberries it, that day. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to do some hands-on pruning? Sure. Yeah. Y'all want to get some hands-on while we still got a little bit of light yeah. left? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got some pruners in the car. Yeah, and I've got some pruners, and I know some people brought their pruners. Um, other questions y'all have before we start doing some hands-on? I have heard at one point um, that you prune the trees once you get the fruit. Any limb that doesn't have fruit, you prune, so that it focuses its energy on the fruit. Well, next year it might have fruit. Mm -hmm. trees are finicky. Sometimes, sometimes a tree is just not going to fruit this year. It's just on fire. I'm not going to fruit. And next year, voila. Full of fruit. Fruit over the side, like if you want it. So that it's a smooth shape and 
And while we got Tony here, anything wisdom on blueberries you want to impart to them? <laughs> yeah. You hit the biggest one is pH. Uh, that's the most important thing. And like we discussed, I was lucky. Uh, I don't have much success growing vegetables. I don't have much success growing uh, much of anything else. But uh, I have some peach trees and stuff. So I just, I just. It's too much of a struggle. Yep. With blueberries, uh, it's, it's not a problem. I mentioned earlier before you got here talking about a lower maintenance fruit. Blueberries are. are definitely a lower maintenance. You now, when do you prune those? Uh, right now. Yep. And you can prune blueberry bushes when you're out in the field picking it. Mm -hmm. They're a lot less picky about pruning time. You know, right after you get done pruning, you can do a little pruning. Now, fertilizing, what do you do as far as fertilizing? Fertilizing uh, started last week, and I fertilized three times a season, and I fertilized three weeks apart. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a, a nine weeks of fertilizing, and uh, I don't use any chemicals on my bushes at all. Uh, we have customers that are uh, restaurants and bakeries and Franklin Farmers Market, and they're very particular about what goes on the bushes and what's in their fruits. So, uh, I have a lot of like weeds, grass, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, they're really, really low maintenance as far as uh, I mean, it, it, it's all fruit trees are going to be the same. You got to prune them. Got to hold up so that light comes in. So, uh, yeah, and blueberries, you know, you're pruning out the old paint right. and keeping new ones, yeah. keeping it bigger. Right. Yeah. The fruit on the blueberry bushes has, I don't know anything else about the other fruit, so I can't speak about the other fruit, but uh, your soil is going to affect the taste of the blueberry bushes, the blueberries. But the more open your bush is, the more sun it gets, the sweeter it's going to be. Because mm -hmm. that's where it that's where it gets its sweetness is from the sun. Mm -hmm. So that open, sugar production. The more open, the better off it is. Uh, I uh, I I don't know where to start about because uh, I don't know what y'all might know about blueberries or not know about blueberries, but. Uh, uh, anytime after class, sometime when I'm there, mm -hmm. y'all just holler at me. If you want to talk about them, I'll talk about them. And, and you've got that handout with the blueberry varieties. If you didn't, come see me. Uh, we've got a great new publication that I put out at our blueberry workshop last year. And we're hopefully going to maybe do a blueberry workshop again this year. So you may get to learn a little bit more uh, specifically on blueberries when we do that with Tony. Um, but uh, it's got great information on variety selection, which is important in blueberry production as well. Yeah, I have uh, 45 different varieties out in my field. Uh, I've got uh, early, early varieties, mid-season varieties, and late varieties, and they're all meshing together as they're getting ripe, which makes my season can go up to eight to nine weeks mm -hmm. because I have the different varieties. What's a typical if you didn't have all those varieties? Uh, month, yeah. month and a half. So he can explain that. that season? Uh, around July. July. Uh, they my, my first start about the second week of June. I uh, don't have a lot of early variety. Oh, we have really bad late breezes around here. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, about the first second week in June, uh, the first of July, there's so many blueberries out there that you can't can't pick them all. They're just they're everywhere. And then uh, if we have a like last summer was not a very hot, humid summer, and we got lots of rains. Uh, we had blueberries up to about the first and second week of August. So, you had a long time yes, last year. We did. People were picking for a while. 
There's going to be more this year. There's going to be more this year. We planted some of our, if, if any of y'all were out at the farm last year. He's at Blue Honey Farm. That's right, Vance. Where's yep. that? Uh, in Eagleville. We, we have uh, Which one's your some of our bushes are getting a lot of hay on them. They're in the 20 year old range and uh, they're, they're not producing as much. And I took a bunch out this year. And we had some holes where some of them had died out. Well, I just replanted 75 five year old bushes that are already this tall and they got fruit buds all over them. I went and picked them up in North Carolina and uh, we will have a ton of fruit this year. A ton of fruit. But like I said, uh, if y'all ever want to ask anything about blueberries in class when we're in class, don't hesitate to come and ask me, Toby. As Taylor will tell you, I don't mind talking about blueberries. He does not, and we appreciate that. Thank you, Tony. I'm sorry we wish we had more daylight to give you more time to talk, but we need to get pruned before we cut yeah, our fingers no off. <laughs> um, so thank you, Tony. So we're going to come down here. Ron's going to take a handful of people who want to prune. Why don't you wrap it up? Please. Oh, yeah. Prepare. Sorry, for the people in there, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to go do some hands-on. If you have any questions about this, we've got experts in all the fruit subjects, so please ask us. Um, and yeah, go to those publications. UTHort.com has some great publications with all the information we talked about. We'll see y'all next week. Yes, if y'all need to leave, I understand, but if you want to stay improved,